G'day everybody, Matt Ellis with you for another edition of the Cricket Library podcast and a very special treat today as we hear more of the Kepler Vessels story. There it is, Shaw calls it forward a square, well played Kepler Vessels, the pressure finally up for this young man, a tremendous innings, a tremendous pressure in front of his home crowd at the Gavin. Kepler takes us back to the origins of his passion for cricket growing up in South Africa, the impact of his time playing World Series cricket, his mindset for overcoming the West Indies pace attack in the 1980s, South Africa returning to international cricket, the memorable test match win at the SCG against Australia, scoring 100 at Lords, transitioning out of the game and so much more, not to mention who he would invite to the Nets. It's time to sit back, relax and enjoy the Kepler Vessel story on the Cricket Library podcast. It's a very warm welcome to the Cricket Library podcast. Kepler Vessels, thanks so much for joining us. Only a pleasure. Well, let's let's get underway, Kepler, and uh, we, we love to go back and find out more about our guests and the origins of their passion for cricket. Can you give us a little bit of an insight into where your passion for cricket started? Yeah, it's a bit different, really. I grew up in, in sort of the heart of what was in South Africa, rugby country, Afrikanerdom, so to speak, in, uh, in the Orange Free State. So it was a little bit unusual to find somebody like that wanting to uh, to progress and, and go on to a cricket career. But at that time, South Africa was still in the international arena and they, uh, they had two Australian tours there, the 66 one, I think, where Bobby Simpson was captain and then the 1971 where Bill Laurie was captain. So I, I sort of got really interested then and uh, and started pursuing uh, pursuing my cricket dreams from that point onwards. Yeah, and you, you break into first-class cricket relatively early. Well, extremely early really age 16 playing first class cricket can you tell us a little bit about the progression from watching those tours and and getting a passion for the game to actually breaking into the first class arena for the first time so during that period your your progression basically was to get selected for one of your provincial teams um, at schoolboy level, which would have been the equivalent of under 19 in Australia these days. Yep. Um, so I managed to do that when I was 14. And when I was 15, uh, I had a really good carnival and got selected in the South African school team. So I was sort of on a, on a path at that time to, um, to continue. And then when I turned 16, I think it was towards the back end of the season, there were a couple of games left. Uh, for Orange Free State at that time. And uh, Colin Bland, who was a South African legend, he he was the back end of his career, but he was my batting coach and he was also captain of the team. So they decided to bring me in for the uh, for the last two matches. And, uh, you know, fortunately, it went pretty well, I guess. So I got 30, I think, in the first one and then a half century in the first innings for the second one. So I was sort of set in that um, Orange Free State team uh, for the next, uh, two years while I was still at school. And you finish school and get the opportunity to go to England to play some first class cricket over there. How did how did that all come about? Well, so back in the day, we always used to get uh, overseas professionals uh, to come out and coach at uh, at the different schools. And uh, we had a guy, Mike Bass, who played for uh, for Sussex, coaching us for a couple of years. He also played for Orange Free State, so. He suggested that during my final year at school, I go over there for a three-week trial um, with Sussex, um, which I duly did, and play second 11 cricket. And that went really well. So then they offered me a contract uh, the following year. And um, yeah, I, I started playing then. The only thing was that, that was sort of disturbed a little bit by national service. I had to go back to South Africa and, and do a year of national service, which oh, I wow. did. And, uh, yeah, and then, um, yeah, so that broke things up a little bit. and and. I wouldn't say it set me back, but it, um, it sort of delayed my um, my d- development, uh, so to speak. So then after national service, went back to Sussex. Um, by then, Tony Gregg was um, was the captain and, and World Series cricket was uh, kicking off. So uh, I got offered a, an opportunity and a contract to come to World Series and, and jumped at it. 
So it was Tony Gregg that was the one that kind of linked you up with World Series cricket and got you over to Australia? Yeah, he was. It sort of culminated in un, in those days. Uh, there were uncovered wickets in uh, in England and, and everybody was always, um, I suppose, petrified of facing a, a Derek Underwood on an undercovered wicket who got um, loads of wickets un, under those sort of circumstances. So uh, I managed to um, to get 100 against him, against Kent, on one of those wickets and, and bat through the innings, carry my bat through the innings. And Tony Gregg was playing in that game. So I suppose that was a, a determining factor. And, uh, yeah, then the contract offer came about after that. And, and, and some early runs, you, you come over to Australia, you, you link up with the Waverley Cricket Club. Uh, early runs there, did that sort of fast track uh, the progression further still? Yeah, it did, because um, the idea was for me to come and play great cricket in Sydney then yeah. hopefully um, break into the New South Wales Sheffield Shield side do that season um, and then the following season join World Series Cricket. But then what happened was, uh, they were, I think they were short in terms of, of opening batsmen, uh, particularly in the Australian squad. And uh, after those two centuries, they decided to fast-track me into World Series Cricket, which was just as well because it finished um, at the end of that season anyway. And, and it gave me a real good opportunity to um, establish myself uh, uh, on the Australian circuit and in Australia as such. And so you really feel like the the World Series gave you the platform to get recognition of your skills and provide future opportunities that were to come along? Yeah, it did. So it, it absolutely put me on the map. Um, I had a good um, a good summer with World Series. I got a couple of hundreds, uh, one in the Super Test, one in a, in a, what would be an ODI now, I guess. And, uh, and just a generally consistent period uh, um, throughout that whole World Series summer. So... Yeah, that definitely put me on the map. And um, with then when World Series finished at the end of, of that season, um, there were a couple of opportunities uh, to go to different states. Um, I was thinking about going to South Australia or Queensland, but in the end, um, you know, I made the decision to go to Queensland. Yeah, and, and was it the chapels in Queensland, were they a bit of a draw for you? Yeah, pretty much. I think oh, I was pretty keen to go to Adelaide, actually. Um, but then it didn't quite work out. And Greg, Greg was good. He, he organised uh, a business guy by the name of uh, Ron O'Connell who, uh, who who sponsored my going to Queensland and um, signed me up. So yeah, and, I, and that was a you know it was a great outcome for me because um, I love playing for Queensland. I really fitted in um, pretty well into their team. So yeah, I really enjoyed it. And you get to make your Test debut at your new home ground, the Gabba, and you, you're batting. Uh, with your captain, Greg Chappell, for, who's a former guest on this podcast as well, Greg, a, a wonderful cricketing mind, uh, a real leader uh, of Australian cricket in that period, playing under his captaincy, and you run him out. What, what happened oh, there? It was actually, it was oh. actually the other way around. He ran the door but <laughs> he, would probably never, he would probably never admit to that, but he hit the ball straight to Derek Randall and run and uh. ran. And ran himself out. So, but look, be that as it may, um, he was going well. He was hitting the ball well. So I realised, look, I was only on about 30 at the time. And once he got run out, I thought, well, I better bat the whole day because I don't really want to go into the change room with a with a cranky or a grumpy Greg Chapel sitting there. So, um, yeah, so it was just one of those one of those times where you know you you play your first Test match, things come together. Um, and, and it just went well. Uh, so, so that was a great day, a great day for me, a great day um, generally for Australia too because we, were, we managed to, um, to get in front of England and, and win that test match at the Gabba pretty comfortably. Yeah, so we've got that on the record now. It was Greg, you, you sent the captain back. It wasn't. Uh... There's, not a, there's not a shadow of a doubt that <laughs> it wasn't my fault. But that being said, maybe I should have just sacrificed myself. I don't know. Uh... Yeah. I think I think think it pro- provided the the necessary motivation to get you that big hundred in, on on debut. Now, um, the West Indies they they were an absolute powerhouse in that period. Uh, you, you're a top order batter, and you had a particularly good series against them after some early failures in Perth. Uh, what was your mindset coming coming to play against that world renowned attack of the West Indies, and 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 how did you overcome? Uh, those early setbacks to to be successful against them. 
Well, what happened was I was fairly confident going into that whole, um, into the test series because during World Series cricket, I, I had a, a fair bit of success against them. So I knew a lot about their bowlers. I knew a lot about how they were going to go about their, their business. But yeah, I definitely changed strategy. I mean, in the initial few innings, um, it was a case of trying to like really get behind the ball, you know, put your body on the line and, and, and really tough it out. And then I realized, well, that's not working because you can be batting for an hour, an hour and a half and, and you're just playing the survival game and then you get a good one and, and you get out and you've got nothing to show for it. So I thought I've got to go on the attack more, be more aggressive. They've got um, attacking skills all the time. And I was under the pump. I think if I had one more failure in Brisbane, I, I probably would have got dropped out of the test side. But fortunately, in the second innings in Brisbane with a, a new strategy or a different strategy, uh, things started to take shape and then... Um, Culminated in uh, in the Sydney Test match where you know it was it was awesome to get a hundred or a big hundred against them because I think at that time there's no question that they were the team that you measured your yourself against. So mm. if, you, if you made runs against them and if you performed well against them, you felt that that you did well against a team that was the best in your sort of playing era. So so that to me was always uh, always important. I think I would have been very point at um, if I if I failed against the West Indies, I always would have felt that there was something lacking at the end of the day. But um, yeah, fortunately turned around it was it was really hard cricket. I mean I always say that World Series cricket and the, and those test matches against the West Indies were by far the toughest um, toughest cricket that I played. Oh absolutely uh, no there's no weak link in that bowling lineup in in um in that time they were they were unbelievable. Now uh Playing for Queensland, you mentioned playing for Queensland before. You were captain of Queensland, and I wanted to ask you about the Sheffield Shield final, 1985-86, against New South Wales at the Sydney Cricket Ground. Uh, A a drawn game, runs for yourself. Um, A couple of wickets too. I noticed you picked up, I think think something like 13 first-class wickets, Uh, and you got Mark Waugh in this one, Mark Waugh and Steve Small, two of your wickets. Um, what are your reflections on that Sheffield Shield final back in back in eighty five eighty six and and captaining Queensland? Yeah, it was actually a bit of a heartbreak uh, two seasons for us because the year before Queensland had never won the Shield and it was that notorious game where New South Wales beat us by one wicket and oh. uh, Alan was Alan was captain um, in that one so so that was a, an awesome game of cricket and we just couldn't get across the line so. Um, so the next year going back was a similar situation, actually. Um, they were eight wickets down. I can still remember it vividly. Um, and there were 11 over to go on uh, on the final day. So with uh, Dutchie Holland and, and Mike Whitney batting, you sort of half fancied yourself to win that one because um, they didn't get any runs at, at international level. And certainly uh, Bobby Holland, the West Indies, they just bombarded him. And uh, so we... We thought that you know it was a good chance to finish it off, but uh, they uh, they blocked it out. They survived, and so back to back disappointments for us. Um, but yeah, Captain Queensland was uh, was a great experience. I mean, I did a, did a few uh, games where I captained when Greg was still captain before Alan officially took over, and Greg couldn't play. So I had some captain's experience there. But then yeah, in the final year after I finished with Australia, the last um, well most of the season anyway, um, I was captain side, and yeah, enjoyed it a lot. And Mark Waugh, your biggest wicket in first-class cricket? Yeah, of course, short leg. Mark Waugh tried to flick one, flicked it straight into short leg. So that was a good one. I was actually bowling quite a lot at that time. Um, so I started bowling for Australian one-day cricket because we didn't have an all-rounder. So yep. Alan Border and myself used to share uh, the 10 overs generally in 50-over cricket. So uh, because Queensland had a predominant pace attack uh, every now and then the quicker bowlers uh, needed a breather so I used to get through my 10, 10 maybe 12 overs uh, a day for them and just try and hold up an end so I was bowling quite regularly Yeah, oh very good and uh, you go back home to South Africa and uh, politically things change and all of a sudden South Africa are back in international cricket what, what was that like for you uh, having the opportunity to to play for your home country and captain your home country in their return to international cricket. Well, it was extraordinary because when I went back to South Africa, not my wildest dreams that I think that I would ever play international cricket again. I thought that that was done and dusted. So what I was doing was playing first class cricket, which 
during that time in South Africa was at a pretty high standard because all the best players were playing all the time and it was very competitive. And I was captaining um, Eastern Province, which is down in the Eastern Cape uh, in Port Elizabeth. But then literally after doing that for about five or six years, uh, Nelson Mandela got released from from Robben Island and um, South Africa were back in the international stage. And within a week, we were on a flight to India. So then um, after that, that was a one-day tour. We only played the three one-day matches. We we flew in in a chartered plane, flew to every venue in that same chartered plane, oh, wow. played the three games and came back. And then it was all about the 1992 World Cup. So so that was pretty exciting. And um, that's when I took over the captaincy. So I knew it was going to be quite daunting leading South Africa back with um, the political issues, as you rightly point out. And also our first game against the World Cup was against Australia. So those were all blokes that I played with for Australia. And um, you know, Alan Border was captain of Australia and we'd always played together and we were mates stuff things. So that was always going to be a tough day for me, a tough day for the team. And uh, it which turned out to be a, a very good day in fact. Yeah, yeah, you get the job done against Australia. And a, and a really successful campaign until rain intervenes at the Sydney Cricket Ground in the in the semi final against England. Yeah, that was an absolute heartbreaker because um, there was a bit of rain about uh, during the day. Um, when we fielded, it, uh, it started to drizzle, and I still sort of remember saying to the umpires, "Look, you know, I don't mind you not taking us off now, but then you need to be consistent." And tonight, if it starts doing the same thing, mm. you know, we'd be expected to stay on. But um, I don't know, it might have rained a bit harder. Um, and we came off. So once we came off, the game was really evenly balanced. I think we needed 13. Uh, we needed, I think, 22 to win or mm. 13 deliveries. Yep. And we were sitting down, but we had two established batsmen at the crease. And England had bowled out all their frontline bowlers. So the game could have gone either way when the rain came. But then with a different rail, rain rule at that time, once the rain came, it, it really favoured the side that batted first. And it was only after that that Douglas Lewis came into the equation, which had it been um, operating that night, we actually were won by three runs. So, yeah, it was a heartbreaker for South Africa. Probably South Africa's best, I guess, performance in World Cups because first time in 21 years, you know, getting through to the semi-final, nearly getting there. Um, and as we know, South Africa, they've never succeeded in winning a World Cup, even though they've had some some awesome teams um, uh, post, post-92. So, it was an exciting time. I think it was one of those periods in South African history where it really brought people together. I mean, we didn't realize the extent of the support that we had until we got back home. So I, I think for the first time ever, really, uh, South Africa, you know, were, were one nation with everybody supporting supporting the team and, and the country changing politically. Uh, so it, it, it was a, an awesome time in history. And to be part of that was, was clearly a privilege. Absolutely, absolutely. And uh, I'm going to steer you towards a, a, a more positive memory now. Sorry for bringing up a couple of the, the, not, the not as uh, enjoyable results, but South Africa versus Australia, January 1994, Sydney Cricket Ground, one of the great test matches ever. Uh, and South Africa come away with a five, five run win in this one. Uh, you guys are bowled out for 169 in the first innings. Uh, the late, great Shane Warne, seven wickets there. Runs for Gary Kirsten and Hansi Cronier. Australia reply with 292. They're in the box seat. Runs for Slater, Martin and Alan Border. Fani de Villiers and Alan, Alan Donald get wickets. You guys post 239. Jonty Rhodes, probably the shining light there with the bat, 70-odd not out. Uh, Warney again, five wickets. And then with Australia, four for 63 at Stumps on day four. Can, can you tell us what the mood was like and what the belief was like within that South African change room, uh, Stumps on day four? Yeah, so we were under the pump that whole game, as you, as you rightly pointed out, and, and, and we were never really, I don't think up to that point, we would have said that we that we won a session. So we were always behind in the game. But... Um, you know, having played for Australia and having seen their demise sometimes in chasing small totals, I just kept emphasising that um, to our team and to our bowling attack. And, you know, South African teams generally, doesn't matter what sport they compete in, they've got that sort of have a go right all in, never say die attitude. And in that side, you couldn't have had a better uh, player 
for that very job than uh, than finding affiliates who who would just never give up and uh, and was pretty skillful. So I realised at overnight that the key wicket was um, the next morning would be Alan Border's wicket. So we it's not often that a plan comes together, but on this particular day it did. So we decided that Alan Donald was going to bowl around the wicket to him and that that we thought that he'd have a chance to knock him over and he did he um he, he bowled him bowled him out clipped off stump with a really good delivery so then australia really were under pressure and um, i knew that once we got his wickets south would set in and although victory was still pretty much unlikely that uh we could get pretty close and that's exactly how it turned out Oh, and he's bowled him, has he? No, that's hit the stumps. Yes, it has. I thought I heard a clonk there. Border's gone. He left that one. Uh, all of a sudden was a half-hearted appeal. What a beautiful delivery that one was. It pitched just outside. Well, round about off stump, held its line, and Border was absolutely amazed. Look down there and just watch the bail go here. This is test cricket at its best. And for 111 now, and uh, we're going to see McGraw having to face the music. Straight back to him, Cotton Bowl. What a game for De Villiers. F- Fani De I, I remember I was um, at a couple of days of that test match, and I remember there were some bushfires in Sydney uh, that summer as well, and there was a there was a charity game at the SCG, and Fani De Villiers was driving his remote control car around the boundary of the ground, and people were throwing money in to donate to the charity. And I, I, I think uh, from an Australian fan point of view, the people really did warm to De Villiers and they, they loved the way, I guess, his big heart. Like, is that the kind of player he was? You, you, you knew you were going to get a big-hearted performance from him? Always. You could, um, you, know, you could always ask him to do the job for you, whatever the circumstances were. I remember even in a one-day international subsequent to that at the Wanderers, I think uh, we were playing Australia again and we had five to defend in the last over. And... I just said to him, look, mate, if there's anyone can do this, it's you. And uh, he bowled, I reckon he bowled five out of the six perfect Yorkers and we won the game. So whatever the situation was, you could always give him the ball and you and you knew that it might not always be the outcome that you wanted, but you knew he was going to give you absolutely everything you had. And, uh, yeah, you rightly point out, I mean, he's a, he's a big personality. He's, uh, he also comes from the Afrikaans side of, uh, of, of, of the South African uh the situation, so a big personality, uh, done a lot of uh, good things uh, in his life. He's got a, a magnificent following, or he had a magnificent following at home while he was playing, and then after that as well. Um, so uh, yeah, he he was just the the perfect guy for that role in that test match. And at a, a century at Lords, uh, as a kid growing up here in Australia, that's one of the kind of hallmark test matches that you want to play as a kid you want to go to England you want to want to get your name on that honor board at Lords but what did it mean to you at the back end of your career to um to to notch that ton on the hallowed turf oh that was just absolutely awesome for me I mean that was the last I would say probably real highlight of my career I was right at the end then I was about 36 I would think and I knew that that was going to be my last opportunity to try and uh, achieve that at Lords. And although, I mean, early on in the evening, you don't really think about that, but then as you get closer, you do. And um, I didn't get one at Lords in 1985 during the Ashes Tour. So once I got close, I, you know, I was pretty desperate to get 100 there. And then, yeah, for me, that was sort of, I suppose, the, the, the last real um, real highlight of my um, of my international career. So that's something that that, that it stays with you forever. Uh, you know, I can still remember a lot of moments during that test match and also to, to top it off, we beat them, um, beat England pretty easily in that one. So it was the first South African tour back to England also in something like 22 years, I think. So it was a big moment. And coming to, to the end and, and the realisation that it's time to finish up playing cricket, what was your transition like out of playing cricket? Because you'd mentioned before that when you went back home to South Africa, you never thought you'd play international cricket again. And you, you get these extra years playing for South Africa later on. Uh, what, was the, what was the transition like for you uh, 
fin- finishing your career as an international cricketer? Well, I was probably a little bit paranoid, I guess, about life after cricket. I probably thought about it a little bit too much. And um, so I was working already. So when I went back to South Africa, I worked in business development at one of the big universities while I was playing. Then I continued into the corporate sector working for a, a security company while I was playing. So I was always planning for life after cricket. But then I got, so I sort of got stuck back in at the back end of my career. I was starting to commentate. I was starting to coach. And then, um, but I knew that, you know, the day that I stopped playing, I had something else to go to. So I was always determined to uh, to be in a position that when I finished, uh, I wasn't going to be looking around for what I was going to do next and, uh, and also try and put myself in a position where I could maintain um, a lifestyle that um, that I got my family used to. I think too often it happens these days that, you know, players don't plan. They think they'll play forever. And what they sometimes forget or some people or some players forget and, and, and across all sports is literally the day it finishes, that's when it's all done. Um, you, if you, if you had a successful playing career, I think you can probably bank on another year or two to make money out of the sport, mm. but then you need to have something else to fall back on. And, and if you don't, um, it becomes a problem. So as I said, I probably thought about that side of it a little bit too much, but in the end, you know, I was happy that I did. Yeah, and one of the things you you moved into was coaching. I'm really interested to pick your brain around what you've learnt from coaching um, and what your sort of coaching philosophy is uh, now that you've finished playing. How, how do you how do you get the best out of other people or help people to see the potential in themselves? Well, the game, or yeah, the game itself has changed so much, but the way players perceive the game and the way players operate these days have, have changed completely. I mean, when I captained the team, I was pretty ruthless, not in a unfair way, but I demanded and expected a lot from the people who, who played in the team. And I also knew at that time that, you know, everybody responds to something different. You've got to approach individuals and players differently to get the best out of them. But so when I transition into uh, into coaching I guess um, I still had that sort of philosophy with me but I realized um, fairly quickly that you know things have changed a lot I mean I, I can still remember we had a I was coaching Northamptonshire on the county circuit at one time and and one of the guys is now actually a first first class umpire Rob White he was batting in the nets and he, he had a shocker in the nets and when he finished I just said mate look that's really not good enough it's really not what we want you know you need to apply yourself and, and, and play like the way that you're going to play in a match. So the next day, I got a call from the Players Association lawyer who wanted to find out what happened at the training session. So, you know, things have changed dramatically. I think these days, coaching and longevity in coaching is all about um, babysitting the ego of the senior players. Um, you, you know, you can't really take a hard line. I think that's what Justin Langer felt. I think players don't respond to you looking them in the eye and telling them the truth. I think it's more about um, babysitting egos. It's more about realizing who the power players in your teams are and then working with them. That's if you want to have longevity in coaching. But I I always think, as far as coaching is concerned, you set yourself a goal, you try and achieve it within two or three years, and whether you achieve it or don't achieve it, you move on to the next thing. But yeah, coaching's filled with um, all sorts of um, all sorts of issues these days. I mean, I think the days like when Bobby Simpson did such a great job with the Australian side and coached him for ten years, I think it was. I think those sort of days are long gone. I don't think you'll find anyone now in cricket who will last that long as a coach. Mm. And uh, now, what, what, what's life like now for you? Uh, what, what, what's your day to day? What 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 gets you out of bed? What keeps you motivated? Yeah. It's pretty good, actually. We're working harder than I'm turning 65. I think I'm turning 65 in September, so I wasn't anticipating to be doing as much as I am. But uh, yeah, so we run a, a boxing fitness business out of Fortitude Boxing in Brisbane. So up in the gym by six in the morning, um, yeah. and then I do match refereeing for cricket Australia. So I do a lot of the shield matches, a lot of the BBL matches. So that's about probably during the season. I'd say probably quite. 50 days work for them during the summer, which is quite interesting because it's the first time that I've that I've been on that side of the fence. First time I've been in officialdom, so 
I've been doing that now for about four years. It took um, took a little bit of getting used to that, but uh, yeah, I've got used to that and enjoying it. So I try and combine those two things um, to keep me going. And, and you're still training heavily yourself in the gym. Yeah, all the time. So um, I do a lot of Brazilian um, Brazilian jiu jitsu, and 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 clearly being a a boxing gym, um, you know, I still get in and, and do the boxing training as well. So just try and uh, keep myself in as good a nick as I can. Yeah, that sounds that sounds excellent. And um, finally, uh, to to wrap things up, our our favorite question to ask people is: if you could have any three people in the world, living or dead, um, at at a dream net session, what would your dream cricket net session be? Well, I'm probably always going to go back to some of the players that I played with. Um, I just, I thoroughly enjoyed having Ian Chapel around in my, in the vicinity. Yeah. I love having Dennis Lilly there, although I didn't really enjoy facing him in the net too much, but I love, <laughs> um, I shared a room with him all the way to World Series cricket in the days when, when you saw shared room. Um, so that was very, um, you know, <laughs> that was very, very interesting, so to speak. Um, and then, um, yeah, you also can't go past, um, I think you can't go past having, um, you know, Rod Marsh around. He was always um, always really good to me, always good in the change room. So, yeah, with those players, and sorry, I'll probably add, add a fourth one in, in Greg Chapel, who I think, um, you know, they um, all added a lot of value to my career. They're people that I looked up to and aspired to be and learned from them a lot. So, um, yeah, if I had have a net session and those boys were there, I'd know that we were, we were in good hands. And, and, and where would you go afterwards? So you'd retreat, retreat somewhere after for a, uh, a bit of a chat? Well, in the, at that time, we could still do that, go out for two <laughs> beers uh, and live uh, <laughs> the days or so the days flat. Uh, and yes, with, with the four of them around, there was never a dull moment. So I, you could generally just sit back and listen and it would, it would really kick off and, and, and be very interesting. Uh, well, that, that sounds like an outstanding uh, selection there. Well, thank you so much for your time, Kepler. I, I've really enjoyed hearing uh, your views on your career and, and the stories you've shared with us today and really appreciate you spending time to share those stories with our listeners on the Cricket Library podcast. Only a pleasure. Enjoyed. Enjoyed it. A massive thanks to Kepler Vessels for joining us on this edition of the Cricket Library podcast. Wonderful to hear about the origins of his passion for the game and how he broke into the first-class scene at such a young age, a teenager playing first-class cricket while he's still at school and the journey that ensued uh, as a result of the, the, the talent that he had, the application, the dedication that he had, getting that 100 on test debut after a uh, sending the captain back, sending Greg Chappell back. I'm glad we had that cleared up. It it wasn't actually Kepler's fault, that one. But he went on to, to make a big, big first inning score in his, his debut test match for Australia. Some great reflections there on what he did to overcome the West Indies, uh, the, the, the mindset that he needed to overcome that West Indies attack. And some great moments captaining South Africa, particularly that Sydney Test match uh, in 1994 and the plan they had to dismiss Alan Border that came to fruition, uh, 100 at Lords. And it sounds like now he's still as switched on and motivated and dedicated as ever, working uh, at, at the gym there, still training himself and providing opportunities for other people to get the best out of themselves as well and enjoying his time as a, a match referee by the sounds of it also. So uh, a, a, another great story, typical of the kind of thing we like to bring you here on the Cricket Library podcast. If you did enjoy today's chat, please tell your friends about it. Please subscribe and spread the word so that other people can continue to engage with these stories that inspire people to love and play the game. Stories like this one from Kepler Vessels, stories like, we've got in the back catalogue the likes of Gregory Stephen Chapel and others in there as well that you might like to go back and listen to Michelle Gosko a recent guest on the show as well and the Cricket Library Weekly will be returning for the summer as well so plenty to look forward to at the Cricket Library this has been Matt Ellis thanks so much for tuning in it's bye for now